Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our, our first major event of, uh, of the year, and it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the, the organizer of the event and also the speaker <laughs> in uh, Miriam Bradley in uh, recognition of a very remarkable book, actually. And uh, it's a book I've had the pleasure to read over the last uh, uh, 10 nice. days. <laughs> it's a long book. But it's going to be, I think, a classic. So I think it has a, a number of features that will make it a reference point for students and scholars alike in the years to come. So that's, there you go. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting my, before I get to the nasty bit, which will be later <laughs> on, I'm putting, uh, I'm heaping um, my, my, my congratulations to the author because I think it's an achievement uh, in its own terms. It's a book which has, uh, a vast amount of, of sources, a, a huge amount of scholarship. The, the, if you check the bibliography, it's not a complete bibliography. There's not a single publication by me, so it's obviously not that. <laughs> but it contains many of the other good people that worked on the topic. Um, it's an excellent bibliography, uh, and it's a really good starting point for anybody who wants to study the field. Um, it's a book that, that tackles objects of such complexity that it takes four pages of abbreviations to give you a sense of all the organizations, structures, international bodies that the author engaged with. And what more, and this is, I'm really hitting the compliments there, I'm really just being uh, gushing with praise, but it's, I don't normally do that, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a nice guy. Uh, um, <laughs> But what I would say, I'm Bertrand Tate, by the way, so I didn't actually introduce <laughs> myself. I'm not in that bibliography. <laughs> but I'd like to point out that one thing that's really striking you when you read this book is just how clearly and lucidly it's written. It is remarkably well written. And I think that's, that's a fundamentally uh, an immense quality to have as an author that you're actually very intelligible throughout. So congratulations on that. Because the topics you're handling are very complex. And the book is actually structured in a very interesting fashion uh, by starting with history, which is a very daring thing when you're an IR scholar. So as a historian, I might take you to task a little bit later about some of that. But, but the start with case studies, which cover the period 1967 until um, actually, if we think about it, the conclusion being in itself a case study until uh, 2022 almost um, is remarkable. You're going to explain to us how the book is structured in more detail in a minute, but it then moves on to concepts and trends, and then it moves on to a third part, which is on agents and actors. So, in a way, this book can be read in different ways, and I've read it the old fashioned way. I took the first page and then I carried on reading it till the end, but you can actually dip into it as you would do an encyclopedia or a, a dictionary, and it works that way too. And, and of course, it will ask you to refer back to earlier parts of the book, um, but it's very, very clearly mapped. So it's very easy to follow. You can, you can really see how an, a reader can actually pick up any chapter and then follow, you know, just follow some of the references, go back earlier in the volume and get a real sense of your argument. So congratulations, because that's actually an incredibly difficult thing to do to produce a coherent volume over something that lacks coherence at the best of time and is often in total disarray. So I think uh, congratulations to our third, the politics of everyday practice of international humanitarianism. And you're going to tell us more about how you came about writing this book and how you structured it. And then we're going to query some of these decisions. So thank you so much. It's a very kind introduction and it's made me a bit nervous because I'm worried that the criticisms that come after my, my little explanation are going to be of the same magnitude, but we'll wait and see. So um, I think it's helpful in introducing this book to explain a little bit where it came from. Um, it's not a, a research monograph. It's not a kind of traditional academic um, book with one single argument. It has 24 different chapters, which, as Bertrand has said, can be, can be read separately. And it basically started life with me teaching postgraduate courses in humanitarianism 
to master's students who were just taking one course in humanitarianism, not, not like many of people in this room who are studying an entire degree, um, either undergraduate or postgraduate or in humanitarian and conflict response or similar. So these were largely students studying international relations or international security, international development. And each year as I taught the course, I kind of expanded it based on questions and feedback from previous years and it kind of grew and grew. And at some point I decided to write it all down um and it, and it benefited very much i think from questions coming from students in the classroom that pushed me to to clarify things that i had always been kind of happy to skate over uh and and pushed me i think to to question some of the things that i was taking for granted as somebody who reads about humanitarianism all the time that's kind of the how I got the idea, I guess, but the motivation also came from my own research, where I often found I was wanting a kind of ref a point of reference for particularly for the, the case studies, which I've mentioned and which I'll list on, on a subsequent slide. I just realized I'm supposed to be clicking through it. Um, that's fine, actually, that one can stay up for now. Um, point okay, that one can stay up for now, actually. Um, and particularly in case studies of different humanitarian emergencies, where I found that the, the sources I could go to would either be a paragraph in an article or a book talking about something else, or six entire books, each of which treated a very, very, made, made a very, very specific argument. And I found I, as a, as a scholar of humanitarian studies, wanted a kind of reference point where I could get chapter length explanations of different different case studies so what i tried to do was write a book that would be useful to my students and i hope it will be um, but also that serves as a kind of introduction to humanitarianism for more senior scholars in other disciplines but related disciplines so for example um, a scholar of political science international relations international law etc i hope that this book would serve as a really useful kind of introduction for them to, to humanitarianism. And also as a point of reference for people might, like me who work on humanitarian issues all the time, but who often need to be reminded of something that they read about many years ago, but forgotten and kind of put all of that into one place. So with that kind of background, it's, the, the book's goal is not to present a kind of new groundbreaking argument. It's to um, bring together a huge range of scholarship by uh, experts from different disciplines um, and to draw out some key themes. So I'm very much an international relations scholar. I work on international organizations. The unit of analysis of this book is really the international humanitarian agencies. Um, and so the kind of themes that most interest me and that I hope I've drawn out more or less throughout the book relate to the interaction between politics and humanitarianism. And I'll give a few examples. One here, right? Um, maybe. If you can just click. Yeah, thanks. So I'm just briefly what I'm going to do today is, is talk through a little bit of the structure and content of the book. Um, Bertrand's done that a little bit. I'll explain a little bit more with a list of chapters. Um, then introduce or give you a little, just really just a taster of three of these themes that I'm picking up throughout the book and try to explain where, where in the book I kind of bring these out. Thanks. So I don't know how well you can read this. It's probably a bit small. This is the structure of the book. Um, so I'm gonna kind of um, talk through this. I think you can probably uh, read most of that. So the book is structured in four main parts, but before that, there's an introduction where I introduce the concept of humanitarian emergencies and the idea of, of humanitarianization. So when, when does a particular event um, or set of circumstances become uh, when and how and why does it become characterized as, as a humanitarian emergency and I'm going to talk about that a bit more in the next slide 
then the next part of the book, or the, the first main part of the book, which accounts probably for around about half the book, is, as Bertrand said, uh, a set of case studies. And there are 11 chapters here. And I'm sure Bertrand, as a historian, is going to tell me I should have started 100 years earlier, or I should have added all, all kinds of other case studies. And I've, I've, I've picked these terribly badly, but, but I'll wait, for, wait for, and let him do that later on. Um, it, the reason I start with the case studies, which is especially for a political scientist um, or, or international relations person is unorthodox, is that I found when I was teaching the courses that kind of were the inspiration for this book. Initially, when I first started teaching them, I would often explain a kind of theory or some concepts at the beginning of the class and then use different examples to illustrate it. And after a few years of doing this, I realized that actually it often worked better the other way around. And I started to move to, to, to flip that over. And I would spend the first half of the class explaining a case study and the second half really drawing out the different issues, more general kind of thematic issues and concepts that link to that. And I found that worked a lot better in the classroom. I decided to, to follow that approach with the book. Um, but as Bertrand said, the idea or each chapter should work as a standalone chapter and there are links between them. So very often, if you were to read one of the case study chapters, um, it will have a lot of cross, cross references, mainly to thematic chapters and vice versa. The second part of the book, so the, so the first part is these case studies, um, which explains the, a little bit the, the context or background of each emergency. Um, and then provides a kind of critical narrative of the humanitarian response. Then parts two, three, and four move from the more abstract, more general to the more, more specific and the more concrete. So part two on concepts and trends um, provides a kind of an introduction to debates about principles and politics in humanitarian action, an explanation of the different ways that international and domestic law interacts with international humanitarianism um, and identifies a few re relatively recent trends in terms of the par parameters of humanitarian emergencies um, and links between humanitarianism and development. Part three then turns to agents and actors, um, explaining the role of media and celebrities, donors, politics of humanitarian financing, governments and civil society in affected states, and different kinds of armed actors, which could be international military forces, national military forces, and non-state armed groups. Missing from that set of agents and actors is, of course, international humanitarian agencies themselves. And they don't get a separate chapter because basically the whole book is about what they do. Uh, then part four moves um, to the kind of nuts and bolts of humanitarian response. Um, Bertrand's probably gonna tell me that it's not really nuts and bolts, but if you're an IR scholar, it, it feels like it feels like fairly detailed. Um, so going through quite critical perspectives on needs assessment, evaluation, and how humanitarian agencies and, and their donors make response decisions, um, a section or uh, sorry, a chapter on, on material assistance and the kind of practical services that humanitarian agencies provide and then a chapter on their, their dialogue, negotiation, and advocacy activities. And then finally, there's a very short conclusion, which looks at how international humanitarianism has changed since the pandemic, with the, the short answer being not much. Um, so this book was a long time in the writing. It took me about five years to write it, I think, and I finished it last December. So I conceived of the, the book project before the pandemic started and, didn't, and had written quite a lot of it before the pandemic started and then kind of needed to, to in some way or other, a, account for the pandemic. Obviously not a big issue with the historical case studies, but um, I wanted to reflect at the end a little bit on whether, whether it really made much, much difference or whether we're seeing more of the same. Um, Yeah, so I'm just going to um, talk through, or as I said, give a kind of taster of some of the 
um, some of the arguments that I'm making or some of the themes that are really running through the book. But, um, so we, this is in a sense, this slide encapsulates the argument of the introductory chapter of the book, where I try to explain how humanitarian emergencies come to be seen as such. And I draw a lot here on, on securitization theory by, by analogy. Um, and again, this isn't a kind of hugely new original argument. I'm really building this on what other scholars have, have already done and said, but I think this is an important argument for the book. So I argue that um, just as in securitization, uh, certain military, international military and political actors have a uh, particular power to label a particular event as a or, or threat issue as a security threat, I should say. Uh, in, where crises occur, it's largely international humanitarian agencies and the media and celebrities that have particular power to call a humanitarian emergency, to define any given event as a humanitarian emergency. And this, um, this argument comes through in, the, in a chapter on, on media and celebrities in particular, but also in some of the case studies, for example, case study on drought and famine in Ethiopia in, in the 1980s. And they achieve this characterization in large part through the use of visual imagery. So if anyone's familiar with securitization theory, there's an emphasis on the speech app. You, if, if somebody in kind of high political office or, or military position just calls uh, an issue a security or a occurrence a, a, or an actor a security threat, then that's enough to, to make them a security threat. And in the humanitarian sector, it's less a speech act and, and there's much more emphasis on visual imagery and specifically the use of images of women and children, either individual women and children or this kind of mass of humanity idea. And this I think comes out most clearly probably in the chapter on the Nigerian civil war, the idea of the Biafran babies. And if in the process of securitization, the kind of um, logic or emotion that's being triggered is one of fear. In, when we think about humanitarianization, it's the idea is to, to evoke pity in the audience, pity, empathy, and compassion. This is sometimes called a politics of pity. Um, and this again, I think comes out in the, in the chapter on, on, on Biafra, uh, on Ethiopia, but also in the chapter on the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And then the, this process of, 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 sorry, of humanitarianization serves to depoliticize and decontextualize uh, the context that it be the context in which humanitarian emergencies occur. And it's very much leads to a focus on the consequences rather than the causes. Um, and this, this is, was certainly evident in, uh, in the case of the famine in Ethiopia in the 1980s, um, in the war in Biafra to some extent. Um, and the outcome of this process, or the, the intended outcome certainly, is a humanitarian response. Um, and a humanitarian response tends to be one that's focused on addressing symptoms rather than causes. Although in, in chapters in the book on, for example, the shifting parameters of humanitarian emergencies and the nexus concept, I also talk about how in some cases, humanitarian response aims to go beyond this. And I think this idea that humanitarian response focuses on, on symptoms rather than causes is, runs throughout most of the book um, with perhaps one chapter, the chapter on, on the um, Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, 2015. I think we could see that kind of as the, the exception that proved the rule in the sense that for um, quite a time, it was conceived not as a humanitarian crisis, but as a health crisis. And as a health crisis, a lot of humanitarian agencies didn't know what their role could or should be. So for example, Oxfam, despite the fact, has great expertise in water and sanitation, 
which is really very useful in an infectious disease outbreak, really didn't know what it could be contributing because it was seeing it as a health crisis and, and not seeing its role, as not, not having a primary role in health or medical care. So my argument here really is that despite the fact that humanitarian emergencies inevitably are driven to a greater or lesser extent, but to always to some extent by political factors, this process of constructing them as a humanitarian emergency really seeks to kind of um, obscure or minimize the idea or, or the idea that they're driven by politics and um, this kind of depoliticizing process, which in fact is, is, is not by any means apolitical. The second theme that comes through, uh, hopefully through a lot of the book, um, which links politics and international humanitarianism, focuses on the ways that politics or political factors actually drive or shape humanitarian response. And I've got a few bullet points on this slide and, and the next one, these aren't meant to be comprehensive in any way. There are probably many more um, examples throughout the book, but just it, this is really just to give you a bit of a taste up. So in terms of uh, political factors shaping humanitarian response, on the one hand, this can be um, the political interests or the foreign policy interests of particularly of donor states, but also other powerful states around the world. They determine which, which, which emergencies get funded and which ones don't. So we can think, for example, of um, funding for Afghanistan. There's a chap on Afga chapter on Afghanistan from 2001 to 2014. Um, and after the, the start of the war in 2001, then obviously there's a massive increase in, in humanitarian funding that was aimed to bolster the, the foreign policy and military objectives of um, the United States, the UK, and the other countries that were involved in the, or that had troops in Afghanistan. Conversely, in some cases, it can be precisely a lack of real, really strong political or foreign policy interests that motivates donors to respond. And here I'm thinking of um, the chapter on the Bosnian war from 92 to 95, where we have this idea of a humanitarian alibi by which donors provide a lot of funding for a very visible humanitarian response as a kind of uh, fig leaf to conceal their lack of concerted political action or or even um, a lack of military action. We could also see that to some extent on the refugee camps in um, in Goma or in the Kivus uh, after the Rwandan refugee crisis, where again it's a kind of the the epidemics enable epidemics in the refugee camps enabled. Um, donors to provide a kind of strong humanitarian response to deal with the, the, the health crises, again, very visible, um, while refusing to, to provide um, the forces to demilitarize the camps. It's not only a question of which emergencies get funded that, that can be impacted by politics, but also how they're funded, what kind of restrictions and conditions donors impose on their funding. We can think of examples from Afghanistan, and I discussed some examples there, um, um, of some kinds of funding coming with the condition that recipient agencies shared information with the Afghan army, for example. And also legal restrictions, and this is particularly the case in, in the context of counter-terror legislation um, and, and often goes hand in hand with, uh, with funding. So, for example, in, there's a chapter on the famine in Somalia in 2011, um, where this is a really important issue that due to counter-terror legislation and the listing by the, by the United States in particular of Al-Shabaab as a terrorist group, funding um, for food aid in Somalia fell dramatically uh, immediately before the famine and was, was part of the, the cause of the famine. Political factors also have an impact on, on what humanitarian response looks like um, in terms of the politics 
and policies of the, the states in which those the response is being provided. And this can come in the in the form of legal and bureaucratic restrictions. And I have a chapter on, on Sri Lanka, 2008, 2009, the end of the civil war there, which, um, uh, which I think is, is best exemplifies these, the, the way that the government of, of a state affected by humanitarian emergency um, can really restrict what international humanitarian agencies are able to do and where they're able to go within that country. Um, linked to that, issues of insecurity, um, the targeting of, of humanitarian agencies and, and aid workers. Um, and, and finally, on that point, uh, the diversion and, and manipulation of aid. And uh, I've already mentioned chapters on, on Ethiopia, on the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide, which are probably the, those that best exemplify these concerns. And then I think because I tend to be thinking about international organizations and, and humanitarian agencies, I think it's important to recognize, and I hope this comes through uh, through the book, that international organizations have their own politics and they're not just passive kind of responders to um, the, the politics of donor states or, or the, the states in which they're working. They're also, I think most international humanitarian agencies, the ones I, I'm writing about, believe, um, and the people working for them believe very much in, in principles and, and mostly believe in working in a kind of evidence-based way. But principles and evidence are not the only things determining what they do um, and where they do it for that matter. They're also, interested in the pursuit of power and resources um, and that's not entirely a bad thing because if you think that humanitarian agencies do good work then you need them to have some kind of power and resources to, to survive and to be able to keep keep on doing that work right but at times the pursuit of power and resources can kind of lead to unfortunate outcomes um, and i I think there's some, some interesting examples of how that pursuit of power and resources plays out. On the one hand, it can lead to kind of competition rather than coordination between agencies. And we see that, for example, in the response um, to the Indian Ocean tsunami is probably the, the best example that, that I have in the book. Um, but also, it, I think this can play out in more subtle ways, including in thinking about power and resources, not between international agencies, but between international and local agencies, or between international agencies, and actually the, the affected populations that they're seeking to assist. And, and one example, um, I discuss in, in one of the last chapters in the book, is relates to how technology in the humanitarian sector seems to be embraced in as far as it um, allows international agencies to maintain control and yet the uptake for other kinds of technology or innovation is often resisted and much much slower um, where it would result in a transfer of power and so the kind of the two examples that i draw on in particular there one is the use of biometrics which not all international humanitarian agencies have embraced but some like UNHCR, WFP have really, really embraced the use of biometrics. And this is something that really gives them, if anything, more control and more power at the expense of, of the power of the, the people whose biometric data is being used. And if you contrast that with the, the slow uptake of the use of cash transfers, which obviously has the opposite effect and is something about um, transferring really or um, autonomy agency and, and power to the, to the recipients of cash. Um, but yeah, so I mentioned that different agencies have taken very different approaches to, to biometrics, for example, and this links to my, to my last point on this slide, which I think is an important one. It, and maybe it's not strictly politics, although, I mean, yeah, depends how you define politics, but I, I, I kind of would include this is that different international agencies have their own institutional cultures and ideologies. And some 
particularly intergovernmental organizations, unsurprisingly, for example, are very, very um, strongly committed to state sovereignty, while some NGOs are much more open to cross-border activities without the consent of the state. We can think about that in Syria right now, but in the book in particular, I talk about, I discuss this in the context of um, conflict and famine in Ethiopia in the 1980s and the cross-border initiative there. Okay, my last slide, very quickly. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about how humanitarian action, despite sometimes being claimed to be apolitical, very often, probably inevitably, has political impacts. And again, this is not by any means a comprehensive list of those kinds of impacts. I'm just really trying to give you a bit of a taste of what I cover in the book. So I've identified three different kinds of impacts. Um, one, and probably the best known um, and most talked about, is thinking about impacts on the, the dynamics of conflict and violence. Um, this comes out in the book, both in a discussion of unintended consequences in a chapter on politics and principles, but also in many of, of the case study chapters. Um, secondly, then, impacts on the capacity and accountability of affected states. Uh, and here, uh, there's, there's a chapter on, on government and civil society in affected states, where I really look at the different ways that humanitarian agencies can, can relate to affected states, um, either supporting the state, um, uh, substituting for the state, or trying to hold the state to, a, to account, and how each of these has sort of pros and cons in terms of um, potentially supporting, but potentially undermining capacity and accountability. And finally then, um, the last kind of impact I want, want to, political impact of, of humanitarian response that I want to mention is how it can have an impact on politics at the global level, on global inequalities um, and, and the distribution and dynamics of power. And here, um, I think that you know there's some really interesting scholarship that I draw on that, that talks about this, particularly in the context of, for example, um, the Nigerian civil war, um, famine in Ethiopia in the 1980s, and how the fact of the humanitarian response in those contexts, and in particular the imagery used by humanitarian agencies there, has had a really long-lasting legacy in terms of how Africa is perceived in much of the global north how our kind of stereotypes and, and preconceptions about an entire con continent. Um, that, however, is not unique to, to Africa. And there's also very interesting research, um, again, which I draw on on this, linked to the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. So I think this, this is um, a really important area where there, there's this really interesting research. I feel like it's an area that's ripe for, for more work there, actually. Um, and, and yeah, so linked to these ideas about the, how, how we see the role, how, we, how different parts of the world are viewed, but also the, the role of different people in the global north, the global south, um, humanitarian response and the discourses that go with it can serve to, to reinforce instead of undermining global inequalities. And I'm going to leave it there and let Bertrand start with his critiques. Well, okay, well, thank you very much. As you can see, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. So, yeah. It's a very, no, it is very, what, what is very striking is the architecture of the book and the way the way things work together and, and how it connects. Now, there are some flaws in my view, one of which is that you're an international relations scholar. And every time I meet one, <laughs> uh, I tend to think it's remarkable how you see clarity when I I see a mess, I see I see complexity, I see people, and you're telling me no, it's organization principles. And I think this is an issue. Your you, long sighted people and short sighted people maybe uh, have different view, world views. And I think that's something I accept completely. You're writing entirely from the perspective of international relations. However, you're talking about everyday practice. And by everyday practice, when I think of the everyday as a historian, I'm thinking Michel de Certeau, I'm thinking um, 
the everyday. You know, I get up in the morning and uh, this is my everyday. And this is, I'm working through the everyday. That's not your concept of the everyday. So what is your concept of the everyday in this book? Um, okay, so the easy answer would be the second edition. I'm going to take that word out. <laughs> I, I, That's I, a cop out. You cannot do that. I, I, I will answer the question. Well, I'll try to answer the question properly as well. But, but it, I, I genuinely, I think, which kind of links to my answer, I guess. I think when I um, chose that title, I wasn't quite aware of how that term is used by people in other disciplines. And um, I became aware a little bit too late. And I, anyway. That's why you should be in second the edition, Second edition <laughs> is just going to be the politics and of, of, of international humanitarianism. Or maybe just the politics. Well, uh, that, do. There's, a, there's a bit of practice. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's, it's a very fair comment. I'm very much coming from this uh, international organization perspective. And so when I'm thinking everyday practice, um, I, you know, it's enough that I'm not just talking about, it, for me, it's enough that I'm, just, I'm not just talking about um, policies coming out of Geneva and I'm looking at how those policies are playing out on the ground. Um, which, yeah, I fully appreciate that's not everybody's idea of everyday practice, but that's that's essentially what I'm get, trying to get at. And I, I hope I do achieve that, at least with the case studies and especially with the, the chapters in the last section of the book, where it's sort of looking at needs assessment, looking at evaluations, looking at the different kinds of um, assistance that have provided cash versus food aid. Uh, critiques of food aid, um, uh, dialogue, advocacy. And my goal there was, or, or the, the reason I structured it that way, rather than having, say, a chapter on protection and a chapter on, on assistance, was because I wanted to um, not assume the outcomes of protection and assistance, I think, are more objectives or hoped for outcomes, and focus on actually what the activities are, which may or may not yield the, the desired outcomes. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely clear. Now, in in the book itself, I'm not going to to, to do a demolition job because I actually like the book and I think it's a great book. But there are there are a few uh, te I like to tease out a few of those concepts. You talk about you use the concept of securitization as a structuring uh, way of thinking about what you're doing, and it, and it works by analogy with humanitarianization. Um, what is very striking, however, is that in some respect the humanitarianization seems to be a bit top down or external in and yet you start the first book the first you start the book with a case study of of uh, of right. Biafra where the Biafrans are the one who actually organize the PR of their own cause oh and and reverse the polarities of, of humanitarianization they are calling the humanitarianization part admittedly not by themselves there's a bunch of other actors you mentioned uh, missionaries in particular i think it's the only place where the missionaries appear so i'll come back to the, to the religious bit as well but this is this is a um, so it's who on securitization i guess is the question humanitarianization or humanitarianization in this particular context that's a really good question um i think i wrote the ethiopia chapter first which you, you can see why um that makes more sense on the humanitarianization argument so i think I think the, the idea of humanitarianization still applies there. If I go back to maybe. So for those who don't remember, Biafra was a civil war in, in Nigeria, uh, or an attempt by a section of the Ni of Nigerian society to, to break away from uh, the federal structure and create a new state on the eastern border of, of Biafra between 1967 and 1970. And it's the first, I think, one of the first occurrence of the term genocide, the use of the term genocide by the Biafran to uh, expose what was happening. So just that's the background. It's, it's remarkably lucidly explained in the book, by the way. So, yeah. Okay, I, that's a really good question. And I hadn't quite thought about it like that. I think it's actually a really good example of the process of humanitarianization, mm -hmm. which have now, we've now got the slide back up here. And on this slide, I've put that the main actors are UN agencies, humanitarian NGOs, media, and celebrities. And I think most of the time that's true. But as Bertrand has picked up, it's not strictly true in this context. Um, but it's 
thinking about it like that is actually fascinating in the sense that the secessionists in Biafra were really kind of manipulating humanitarian aid, but manipulating this process of humanitarianization and really using it, creating a narrative that this was a, a humanitarian crisis, that if they stopped receiving um, aid, that there would be genocide perpetrated against them, which probably wasn't true. Um, and, and so the, it's, I think it's a really good example of humanitarianization, but a really bad example on the actors that I've written up here. Um, and these are the primary actors, uh, but not, and in most cases, the primary actors, I should say, but, but certainly it doesn't have to be led by them. And I think it would be interesting to think counterfactually about the Biafran case, about how effective the, the humanitarianization process would have been if it wasn't picked up by the media, by uh, NGOs, the, ch the church groups, and by missionaries. I think it probably required them, but you're right, they, they weren't really the instigators. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and this is not to detract from the book, because in fact, what I want to stress is that the book is full of nuances like that. And contrary to other IR specialists I like and admire profoundly, like Michael Barnett, um, I don't actually disagree profoundly with everything you write. So I think that's very much, uh, we're very much on the same, on the same page. Uh, and, and I think that this is, this is something, so in a sense, what I'm critiquing is, is the presentation rather than the actual yeah. book. But, um, but it's, it's important to, to, to keep that in mind because I think it's, a very, it's full of really interesting insights. And one of, one of the, the lines that runs through a number of case studies, of course, um, the dubious meaning of or the contested meanings of of humanitarian protection and you give two re, two really powerful examples in the case studies and you go back to it in your analysis one is of course uh bosnia but the perhaps the lesser known one is is the, the end of the sri lankan um civil war now the sri lankan civil war for those who are not uh uh, aware of um, of it was a major conflict uh, starting in 75 or 83? 83, 1983, the, and which was the, essentially a Tamil independence movement in, in northern Sri Lanka um, and a, a, an organization which, which practiced suicide bombing before anybody else who actually innovated in all sorts of oppressive manner against a state that was equally violent and brutal in, 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 in and eventually won the war. That's the main thing, that that state destroyed this insurrection. So we are at the end of the conflict. This is the case study you exposed. Why did you pick it up? Because I remember it very precisely. You see that there was a moment, there was a moment an HPG, uh, uh, HPG humanitarian uh, practice group who, who actually gathered to talk about humanitarian space and people were coming back from Sri Lanka and everybody was in floods of tears. So it was an unbelievably traumatic moment for humanitarian actors. So what happened with humanitarian protection in Sri Lanka and why do you think this is a very important case study? Okay, so um, I guess like all of the case studies, I selected it because I thought it exemplified a particular dilemma or challenge or, or set of dilemmas or challenges in humanitarian response. Um, so, so although the, as, as I said, the, the war started in, I think the early eighties, but it could have been the seventies. It was really the last couple of years that were really brutal. So 2008, 2009. Um, and the, the Tamil, Tamil Tigers or the LTTE um, were really close to being defeated militarily. The, the government response was, was very brutal. And the government succeeded quite incredibly in, in manipulating international humanitarian agencies. And, and the UN in particular came under huge criticism for, for its role and its failure to protect the population. And the, and the kind of, I guess, the main uh, lines of debate inside Sri Lanka at the time were based on an 
were, were should we come out more strongly? Should we say something? Should we publicly criticize the government? Or should we take a really strong line against the government, even in, in private dialogue regarding their, their violations of international humanitarian law, their bombing of civilian um, areas, and so on? Or would that endanger too much our humanitarian space? Would that prevent us getting access or maintaining access to provide um, food, medicine, etc.? This is a dilemma that's not in any way unique to Sri Lanka, right? This is this is pretty common in in armed conflicts. I think the reason it's such a striking example um, is that the hum humanitarian agencies working there didn't really have any humanitarian space. They didn't really have access to provide food and medicines. And yet they still kept sort of in each round of thinking about this, kept concluding that they should keep quiet, respect Sri Lankan sovereignty, um, and keep hoping that the government would do what it kept saying it would do, that it would yeah no soon soon we'll give you more access etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i think it's a kind of it's a really good example of this dilemma that we see more widely but it's one where it's so striking that even at the time it should have been obvious it with with that kind of dilemma often with hindsight it's it's obvious that maybe you should have taken a different approach but in that case i think it was obvious to many people working there at the time um and it also led to huge criticisms in and, and an internal UN report, which is quite, for being an internal review, is, is really striking in terms of the level of criticism. Yeah. I mean, you, a lot of case studies that about damning episodes or, or dilemmas. So, so, I find, um, so I find it strange that there is still a, a bit of optimism in this book. <laughs> Uh, and there is an awful lot of optimism in the second half or, or the, the, when we get to the concept there, there is a, a faith in in some of the some of the, the modern approach so i wonder what you what your take is on on the direction of travel of humanitarian since 2016 2016 the Human, the world humanitarian uh, summit which uh, announced a grand bargain uh, a new negotiation uh, on a global stage and promised uh, a range of things, including more localization, more agencies, and greater respect of sovereignty. So, am I optimistic? It's interesting. I'm, I don't often get called optimistic. So, <laughs> I, think um, um, I think, unlike some IR scholars, I'm not sure optimistic is the right word, but I'm optimistic that the humanitarian sector is will continue i don't think it's about to 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 disappear i don't know that i'm that optimistic about humanitarian response about the outcomes suddenly being either grander or more positive or less problematic than they are in the case studies in the first half of the book I, I guess my personal perspective is broadly um, against the, the, the direction of travel in much of the sector in the sense that I'm in, probably in favour of a more limited humanitarian response and being more honest about the limitations of response. And that's not really the main direction of travel in recent years. So I, I don't think humanitarianism is the answer to questions of development or peace building. Um, uh, and, so what and is not, the answer to that? Um, I mean, keeping people alive, keeping people well, in ideally a short term. But I, yeah, I, I'm more in favour of a smaller uh, and less ambitious humanitarian sector than uh, a bigger, more ambitious sector. 
That's very, that's very interesting. There, 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 there's another aspect that I'd like to you on, which could, you talk a lot about the politics, and it is about a book about the politics of humanitarianism. It's also a book about the belief systems, isn't it? And I wondered if, at what stage do some um, late motives or some some uh, uh, new agendas acquire the quality of a belief system? Oh, that might be the next book. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's a good question, but I don't. I don't think I don't think the answer lies in those pages, and I don't think it's I, I in think my the, brain as well. I mean, the, the, you sort of evoke them in, in a lot of places. There's a lot of moments when you actually you actually highlight um, uh, profound belief, for example, in the cash system, cash transfer system, right. as a panacea. And you evoke a number of solutions that are supposed to resolve really complex social social uh, issues, so sexual violence, etc. And every time they are disappointed because, in fact, they are belief system. They, it's they, not that optimistic, you say. No, it is though. <laughs> but the, you, I think you, you you point out at those belief systems, and uh, um, maybe it, you should do the next book on belief systems. But, but I want one last question, yeah. which is about international law. This is a very strong book on uh, logically considering your background about international humanitarian law, and also the issue of uh, how humanitarianism applies to certain settings of extreme violence, but not others. And I know this is the next book, but I'd like you to, to basically uh, foreground those big questions for us. I don't think I understood the question. How, how is huma international humanitarian law limped, constrained by, right. by, by politics to only apply to certain contexts and not others of violence? Okay, great question. I guess I'd expand it as well, maybe to, to refugee law, which which I touch on as well. So there, there is one chapter on, on law in the book. It's because I can get quite nerdy about international law. For me, it felt like the most underdeveloped chapter. I think it was the longest. And that, and that was after I cut out huge chunks of it. Um, but that's, I, I realized that I shouldn't kind of impose my particular um, law nerdiness probably on, on this kind of a book. Um, so I think uh, I don't, go into it in so much detail there in a way, but I be, particularly partly because of the case studies that I'm looking at, case studies that have been these kind of big, have presented big challenges and dilemmas in humanitarian response. And that almost by definition means that they, there was a significant humanitarian response in those contexts. So one failure actually on case selection, I mean, or on selecting cases that way is that I don't deal with any context that just didn't really get much of a humanitarian response. I mean, I deal with them when I discuss donors and funding, but the, we don't have those kinds of case studies. So, um, so in a sense, the the kinds of uh, cases that don't get a humanitarian response where IHL doesn't apply are not treated in detail in this book. But um, you know, the refugee definition that relates that dates to 1951 is very much a product of its time and the polit politics of its time. And in fact, has been expanded in, in Latin America and Africa precisely because it, it, it didn't fit refugee situations there. So I think the, the kind of issue is that um, armed conflict in international humanitarian law has a very particular definition. And we look at the levels of violence in many countries around the world, especially in, in Latin America, which is the region I know best, but but also in um, South Africa, in, in many countries, um, you have very high levels of violence that exceed the levels of violence in, in armed conflict contexts, but they're not, they don't reach the thresholds for international humanitarian law to apply. That means that the international humanitarian agencies that I'm focused on in this book don't have such a strong mandate to work in those settings. Um, and it means that the, the, the international rules on the, the use of force are less clear. I think we could say similar things or by analogy and, and refugee law and, and where that applies. Refugee law is a bit different in that it doesn't exactly provide a mandate for international humanitarian agencies. Um, but it does, of course, put it, it, people are fleeing a country, and it, I guess it comes out in the chapter a little bit on, on the migration crisis. So that's my, my most recent case was looking at the, the migration crisis in Europe, um, sort of from 2015, pretty much up until 
more or less up until now. Um, and the, the kind of the ways that international law affords protection to some individuals and not to others, and not necessarily in a needs-based way. So you can have migrants, particularly during their journeys, um, being extremely vulnerable precisely because of the, the policies of, of, of the states that they're transiting through or, or states of destination. Um, but if they're not fleeing violence or persecution, then they're not meeting the criteria for refugee status. And therefore, for example, the mandate of UNHCR doesn't kick in. So I think it's kind of because it's international law, it's often seen as being outside of politics. But actually, what I hope I bring out in the chapter on law is that it's very much kind of political decisions behind these, these definitions and categories. No, I think that that's the, the, where the book is, is remarkably successful, is that you, you actually bring out the politics of needs assessment, you bring out the politics of, of a multitude of actions that may find state. So uh, congratulations for the book, but let's open up to the, to the room who may have read the book, from what I know. Anybody's read the book? No. But they will ask questions based on not having read the book, which I think would be... Can I just emphasize, you can just read a chapter if, if there's something interesting. It's really not meant to be a book that you... Don't be put off by the fact that there's nearly 500 pages. I, I don't Only think, Bertrand has I don't, think should, I don't think it should be put off at all. I think you should have it on your shelves. You should read it. And you should <laughs> actually dip into it as and when you need it. And I think that's the best compliment you can make to a book, is that this is a book that will serve you. Uh, for a number of years, and I think that's kind of a, it's a I think it's a, re, it's a genuinely impressive achievement. So thank you very much. I think you should be really proud. Let's take some questions because I could carry on asking her questions and be really rude to her for hours, but <laughs> but it, it wouldn't help you. So anybody's questions? 